We then had the TNA Slammiversary show. As noted, I had low expectations for this show going in. And just like the last WWE show, I was pleasantly surprised with what I got. This is a really good show. It opened with an Ultimate X match between Kenny King, Chris Saban, and Suicide. They did about the uh, phoniest, most contrived three-way spot I've ever seen. A spot that involved Kenny King having to sell a kick by stumbling around the ring and somehow ended up straddling on Saban. So Suicide could hit them both at the same time. Not the craziest Ultimate X I ever saw, and that is in no way a complaint. A bunch of big moves, almost nothing off the cables, really. Did do one big wacky tower of doom spot. And finally, Kenny King and Suicide were both going for the uh, title belt, but King managed to turn Suicide's mask around, and Suicide had to drop down to uh, either fix it, or I guess the idea was to protect his identity. And uh, while that was going on, Saban arrived at the intersection, and they had a brawl with King, and he ended up Dropping King of the Mat, hanging upside down by his knees, and he reached up and grabbed the belt and won. So there's Saban, you're a new X Division champ. Very good pay per view opener. Then he dropped to the ground and dropped the belt on his own face and got it busted own. open. It ended up looking cool. So he's up on the stage, bleeding from the head, holding his belt up, all is happy, and out should come Hulk Hogan. Hogan cuts this promo saying Boston loves champions. They love Chris Sabian. It's Chris Saban. Called Saban the future of the business. He said the X champion would get the uh, or the X division champion would get a shot at the world title at Destination Next this summer. Saban didn't get to talk; he just went to the back. Hulk then moved to the ring for Hulk Hogan business. Moving on, he said, because now the midget stuff's out of the way. So Hulk cut this promo. <laughs> I don't want to accuse anyone of anything, but I would not be surprised if Hulk Hogan had been drinking on this day. More than likely, he was taking something for the pain in his that's, burnt hand. That's also possible. Point is, he may not have been in his right mind. Or maybe he was, and this promo just sucked. <laughs> or maybe he's just gone crazy. He pointed out a fan, I'm guessing, I'm guessing this is what happened, that he pointed out a fan dressed like Randy Savage called a macho man, just a middle, in the middle of all this. Aces and Aids arrived, talked about how they're going to steal the show and leave a mountain of bodies. Hulk Hogan described them as, and I quote, pussies wearing leather, flashed in the middle finger, called Garrett Bischoff a bitch like his old man, said the aces and eights were, this is also a quote, foaming at the crotch. <laughs> Hogan finally introduced the baby faces for the six-man tag. It was a greatly difficult task. The enigmatic enigma. That is what he called Chef Jeff Hardy. Hardy. The enigmatic enigma. This was something else here for the Hulkster. I still I still do not understand why Hogan made this announcement like he was signing a brand new, fresh, on-the-spot match, even though they'd announced the match on Thursday, although they did announce a different participant on the heel side on Thursday. Not a matter entirely. But yeah, this interview was no good. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I can't say no good. It made me laugh. It was memorable. It was not it was just memorable. the promo. It was definitely memorable. It may have been bad, but it was not no good. So we had the six man, Joe and Magnus and Jeff Hardy versus Mr. Anderson, Wes Briscoe and Garrett Bischoff. It was a pretty much by the numbers match. Wes Briscoe sucks. He fucked up a twist of fate. Twice. Yes. So uh, Jeff picked up, tried another one. He fucked that one up too. Joe and Magnus hit all their double hit all their double teams, and then uh, Joe brawled with Anderson on the ramp. Briscoe managed to nut shot Magnus and make a cover, but then Hardy came at the top and sent on Briscoe and pinned him. And uh, it was pretty good whenever West was not involved. They showed a bunch of highlights throughout the show of Sting winning various world titles. Pro I bet most of them he had his career on the line. They showed him beating Jeff Jarrett in two thousand six. And the overall impression I got out of this was, man, Sting sure has had a lot of last matches. Joe Park cut a promo, making jokes about Boston. Tried to get serious, talking about what the Aces and Nates had done to his family. And then suddenly, Devon and Knox attacked him and laid him out. They laughed, they walked away, and the last thing we saw here was Joe Park's hand reaching up, sliding down the wall, and leaving a bloody smear. Yes. That was tremendous.
That was good. That was very excellent. You know what wasn't excellent? Jay Bradley versus Sam Shaw. Yeah. On pay-per-view. Pay-per-view, everybody. Pay-per-view. Sam Shaw sucks. He has no gear. He was wrestling on pay-per-view in basketball shorts and amateur shoes. This match would have been mediocre in Ohio Valley Wrestling. It was bad on TNA pay-per-view. Bradley won with his lariat. Christie asked him, quote, how does it feel? Bradley replied, it feels good. He repeated his vow to win the world title. Keep in mind, they cut Brian Cage. I have already lost track of all these dudes. I, I he cannot, he not, he, I'm sure he was better than Sam Shaw. Earlier you said the whole Kogan promo was no good. This was the segment that was no good. Yeah, this match was bad. Borash interviewed Aries and Rude backstage. Rude reminded uh, everyone he was the longest reigning champion in company history. He took a shot at Gunner, like uh, like Rude was Storm's ex girlfriend, and now he was jealous of the new girl Storm was dating. And the best part about all this is that Rude is the one who dumped Storm. Joe Park was supposed to wrestle Devon. Park never showed, so Devon cut a promo running him down. Ordered the ref to ring the bell and count Park out. The ref did. Still better than the Sam Shaw match. Yeah? Uh, nothing. Yeah. Devon uh, ran him down for a while. Ran Biting my time. Biss for a while. Said if Abyss was here, I'd whip his ass too. But he's not here, so we're going to drink beer and play with strippers. That's what he said. At this point, Abyss came out. I thought he wanted to drink beer and play with strippers with them. Now I shall speak. I don't want to make any accusations. But Joe Park and his trail of blood, Abyss was also bleeding from the same spot. Highly suspect. I, I don't get the connection. Hmm. I don't see where you're going with this. So Abyss came out. Uh, the ref rang the bell, and suddenly there was a match on, and suddenly it was a title match. And a bad one. It was not very good. Uh, Knox interfered, so Devon could get the heat, and Abyss made every Abyss comeback you ever saw. Pinned him with a black hole slam. This is this is every impact match you ever saw just on pay per view. Did Abyss always roar and, and display his arms in a Abyss has always crossed I shouldn't say crossed the line. He's walked a fine line between legitimately being a big scary guy and being a big Muppet pretending to be scary. Hmm. And uh as of late, uh I think Dave noted either in the newsletter or online that uh he's slowed down. I would I would say he looks like he's gotten clumsier. Maybe just because he hasn't been abyss in a while. But uh, Abyss has not looked good as Abyss in his latest uh, appearances. What's funny is when Joe Park bleeds and and he turns into unmasked Abyss and runs wild, I think that's a way better uh, comeback than the one Abyss has been doing as the real Abyss. Yeah, I, I'd agree. So Dixie Carter came out to make the uh, announcement. She just said there would be, a, I, guess it was, I guess they had said there would be a, a Hall of Fame inductee. The crowd chanted, thank you, Dixie. I was baffled. She called for the whole roster to come out for the uh, announcement. Chris Saban, the new X-Division champion, and apparently the guy who's going to be a world title contender, was standing there in a wife beater in board shorts, like any 13-year-old geek of them all. So uh, Kurt Angle is going to the Hall of Fame. Sting was out there as well one segment before he arrived. Is that right? Yeah. I do I do remember him being out there. I did not know that he later arrived. So yeah, uh, Sting was out there. Kurt Angle was going to the Hall of Fame. They had a really nice video, and then they brought Kurt to the ring for a speech. I cannot call it a promo. It was a uh, speech. And um, Kurt Angle, who has done a lot of shit in this life, who has won a gold fucking medal, he's been through triumph and tragedy, he has... Uh, he's produced offspring. He's raising children. I'm trying to think of all the... He had a long career, made a lot of money in the largest wrestling company in the world. Kurt Angle was so moved by this Hall of Fame induction into TNA wrestling. He was openly weeping. He uh, talked about how... He thanked Dixie for bringing him in, thanked his family for the support. 
said the originals like AJ and Jorm and St- Jorm. Joe and Storm and Rude was the best roster in the world and quote, they make me look good. He thanked Jeff Jarrett for founding the company and uh, was just very moved. Taz, the Aces and Aces announcer, also talked about how much he respected Kurt. Wants to take down the company, but it's the Hall of Fame. And yeah, I must respect the Hall Respects of Fame. Respects the Hall of Fame and this company wants to destroy. Yeah. So there you go. That was something else. Did like everyone breaking kayfabe. That was funny. Yeah. The show is staying beating Joe in 2008, including Joe's running, diving, dropkick on the cement. I cannot believe Joe is still walking, let alone wrestling. That was so insanely stupid. Bad Influence had a great promo backstage. Didn't write down the whole thing. Just the line about how they had made the tag titles important. They had uh, made the titles important enough for Chavo Guerrero to come into the company. Important enough for two great singles champions to form a team. And important enough to bring Cowboys and Vikings together at last. It led to the four-way tag match. Hernandez and Guerrero versus Aries and Rude versus Bad Influence versus Gunstorm. Storm's leg was not taped up at all. I still like Beer Gunny the best. <laughs> beer Gunny. <laughs> Regardless, uh, Storm's leg was not taped up at all. Sometimes it looked like he was limping. Sometimes he looked totally fine. He is 80%, apparently. Uh, that sounds about right. Uh, very early on, Bad Influence was disqualified for using a chair. That was some bullshit. Right after that, Chavo got pinned because he'd been hit with a chair. So it was Aries and Rude versus Gunner and Storm for what were effectively at this point the, the vacant tag titles. And it turned into a fun fun TV tag match. Or not, uh, better than that. A fun pay-per-view tag match. Gunner's finisher is a torture rack. They're calling it the Gun Rack, which is awesome. Great name. They ran wild on Gunner, hit him with a 450. He kicked out. And the chance made a big comeback. And they, it, was, it was sometimes the guy will hit a move out of nowhere and get a pin. And sometimes they'll make a comeback. And they'll say, I'm going to hit my finisher now. Everyone look and watch and cheer. And they'll hit his finisher and win. This was the latter. Uh, they did a big, big tease up to, to Storm just hitting a super kick. And uh, Gunner hitting the gun rack. And Rude submitted. And we had the uh, new tag team champions. I thought this was the best thing on the show to this point. Although by the end of the night, I'm, I was not sure about that. I'm sure I was still in the same universe, actually. Yeah. Borash interviewed Brooke Hogan and her boobs backstage. Brooke and her bo- boobs bragged about the women's division for a while. Borash asked them if they still love Bully Ray, and they walked away. In one of the most overachieving matches I've ever seen in my life, and I don't think that's hyperbole, Gail Kim and Taryn Terrell had one hell of a match. <laughs> Tiffany! ECW Tiffany... By the time this was done... It was ECW Tiffany. Well, yeah, but... <laughs> I think we can fairly say that Taryn is the toughest ex-Playboy bunny we've seen. Oh, man, I have to think about this. They had a hardcore match. It was a last woman standing match. I did like how in this match, where per the rules of the match, the idea essentially is to give your opponent a concussion. One of these women is going to walk away with brain damage. And Taryn comes out happy, smiling, high five in the fans. Well, she was confident that she would give the other woman brain damage. Apparently she was rightfully so. You know, it's funny is on Twitter, I I was tweeting for a while here and there, and I, I sent out the question, will the finish of this match be better or worse than the finish of John Cena versus Ryback? You did, just, you did say that. And uh and and I got a fair number of responses, but suffice to say, people were shocked. That in fact, this finish was not only better, it was a billion times better. <laughs> yes. Because it was a finish. <laughs> by, by, by default, it is a billion times better. So, uh, Taryn did not get off to a great start. First notable spot of the match, she did a body press on Gail, who was holding a chair. And Taryn sold this by grabbing her ribs and laughing. And I thought, well, maybe I'm the only one who noticed. And then a fan screamed, Stop laughing! Started brawling on the floor. 
Uh, Gail used the ring post figure four, and then Taryn came back, and she used the ring post figure four, and I'm stunned she did not hit her own head on the ground doing this. So Gail's on the apron, and Tiffany charges, and Gail dodges, and Tiffany essentially does a tope through the ropes and lands on her pretty little face on the steel ramp. Holy crap. I wasn't, uh, maybe I was the only one that, I was not blown away by the spot. There's no drop off. It's steel. It is steel. Yeah. I'll, I will give her that. This is not like jumping in the middle of the ring. It's not landing on the floor. You're I will right. give her that. You're right. It's, uh, I'm sure it's not as hardcore as the announcers were selling it, but I wouldn't do it. I, of course, if I tried, I would. You've trip. got, you've got great weight. I would trip on the ropes and, uh, die but uh yes uh, i have great weight i also do not make a living with my face gravity is not on your side i don't think she really hit her face is my point mm -hmm. i think it's fake but it looked good still a chance to take did look good she has she can make way more money being pretty than she can in this sport so it did look good then they started fighting out there gail leg sweeped her out there she took a flat back bump on the steel ramp craziness the tease a pile driver, which in hindsight was not the best thing for this show. Hopefully it was a power bomb they were teasing. That's possible. I never thought of that. Anyway, it didn't happen. And Taryn fought free, and she grabbed Gail by the head, and they jumped off the ramp, and the camera angle was uh, on the other side of the ramp, and so we just saw them jump off the ramp and disappear. Yeah. We had no idea what happened. We just heard people screaming. And my initial thought was, well... They had shot it this way so we couldn't see them landing on a big crash pad. That was what I thought. Yeah. So they go over there, and the two women are laying on a, what looked like a pretty average, pretty black mats. And Taryn gets up, and Gail doesn't, and the ref counts 10, and Taryn Terrell wins. The crowd was chanting, holy shit. They were chanting, this is awesome. And uh, they showed the finish from another angle. And Taryn won this match. With an ace crusher off the ramp to the floor. An RKO, everybody. Yeah. Onto the pretty black mats. And she splatted. This was this was a drop off, Brian. This was uh this was absolutely insane. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can't uh, downplay this at all. She was crazy. This yeah, she is she does call herself the hot mess. I mean she could have just done like a She could have landed on her feet. Yeah, there's a lot of things she could have done. There's a million ways she could have done this that are not involved taking a flat back bump off the ramp to the floor. She chose poorly. <laughs> but, hey, hell of a match, and they were fine. I'm not sure her ex-husband, Drew McIntyre, has ever had a match this good. One thing if, like, uh, you know, thank God they didn't get hurt. Yeah. But the fact that nobody got hurt, you know, she pulled it off. She pulled it off. Pulled it off at the best match of her career. Yes. Best moment of her career. Yes. It was, it was really quite amazing in a lot of ways. So we talked about all these uh, Sting moments we've been showing. The last one, it was Sting beating Mr. Anderson for the title in 2010. Mr. Anderson was once the champion of the earth. Twice, actually. Yeah. I actually remember one time he won it. I, there, was, there was one time he won it on pay-per-view, and it was actually the, the great payoff for the story they've been doing. It didn't lead to anything. It led to him now being a flunky in Aces and Eights, but this match I had zero memory of, and it was Sting wrestling Mr. Anderson. It involved Bully Ray in a tuxedo and a mystery run-in by a guy in a scary clown mask. This was TNA on acid. Kurt Angle versus AJ Styles. AJ got new music, and I was I, that makes me very, very sad. It's a slow, it makes me sad, but it's a good song that fits his character. That part is true. But he's had the same song, or actually he's had about a dozen variations of the same song, but since day one of TNA, this goofy You Are, You Are, I Am, I Am song. The song where he now sings, you wax nostalgic about this wacky song? The song where he talks about giving respect to the other guy. And letting the inside show from the outside, whatever the fuck that means. So when the song started, his new one did, and it's this kind of slow, bluesy guitar music, I was hoping so hard it would be the same lyrics to slow down. But no, it's a totally brand new, different song about being a changed man.
So the opening, they went a long time. The opening was pretty slow. A lot of AJ working over Kurt's taped up knee. You know, the one he hit with a hammer. A mere weeks ago. And the uh, crowd still does not know how to react to AJ. This angle is not working. Well, I don't know if I can say that. It's one thing to say the angle's not working when you watch the angle and you're like, okay, the idea here is he's a baby face. Or the idea here is that he's a heel. Mm-hmm. But when you watch the angle, it's like, I don't even know what they're trying to accomplish here. Right. And it gets no reaction. Then actually, perhaps you could say it was a successful angle. That's their their goal? <laughs> They've successfully made him a tweener that nobody cares about. Because <laughs> okay. when I watch the booking, that's exactly what I expect to happen. I will admit, Brian, I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> that just didn't occur to me. That may have been their goal. I don't know if that's their goal, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Like when you when you try to push, uh, when you try to make people care about Curtis Axel, but he never beats anybody and he's always secondary, then, all right, it's not working because you're trying and it's failing. Yeah. But I don't even know what they're trying to do with AJ. To me, they're trying to make him a tweener, which to me is therefore a success. He is a successful tweener that nobody gives a shit about because they can't figure out if he's a baby face or a heel. So the finish of this match, by the end, it was really, really awesome. And uh, AJ went for a springboard 450 and missed. He went forehead first into the mat. Looked like it sucked. This looked worse than anything in the women's match. It actually did. And they did it. he survived somehow because it led right into a bunch of switches and counters. And finally, Kurt hit a double leg takedown and essentially landed in AJ's guard and pinned him. Yeah. Is that accurate? That's exactly what happened. Yeah. So... AJ, whose whole gimmick was that he lost some matches and so his life was destroyed. Now he's coming back. He lost again. <laughs> like two matches in. So I don't know. I don't know what in the hell happened here. I, I watched it. I figured there must there must be a post-match sort of angle or something like that. Yeah. Nope. He just lost to Kurt Angle. All right. <laughs> Moving on. Bully Ray cut a backstage promo. Said Sting had agreed to a no holds barred match, and this was stupid because he was going to bring back the most dangerous hold in wrestling. The move wrestlers feared. The move there was an unwritten rule that you will not do to each other. The dreaded Martinet. Yes. The pile driver. He's going to try and break Sting's neck with it. It was a great promo, but it sure did look like Gale was teasing a pile driver earlier in the same show. On the ramp, mind you. Yeah. So they started brawling. Early in the match, Sting whipped him into the corner, and the fans told him he still had it after an Irish whip. Taz was talking about how he got his neck broken in a pile driver. He was still afraid of the move. That's actually a very good reason. Ray had a clothesline on the floor and suddenly turned and ran to the back. And I mean he ran to the back. And then he came running back out with a chair. I guess there are no other chairs at ringside. They whacked each other with it a few times. Ray had torn Sting's t-shirt apart to uh, hit some chops to the chest, and Sting never bothered tearing the shreds off. He just walked around with half a t-shirt on. Brooke and her boobs came out, concerned for uh, their husband. Sting sent them to the back. Ray hit a nut shot, used the chair a lot more, and then he just... Put Sting in the ring, hit a pile driver, and Sting kicked out. That little was early. Anticlimactic. Little early. I guess they only had so much time. Uh, it was uh, not just early, but it was it was poorly executed. They did no tease for it. It's not like Ray was trying for the pile driver throughout. He just threw Sting in. First time he went for a pile driver, got it, and then Sting kicked out. Turned out to be turned out to be much ado over nothing. Sting got power bombed through a table, kicked out of that too. At which point, Bully Ray pulled out a knife. Knife! A sharp implement used to kill people. He did not kill Sting. Don't know why. It was no to you. Started cutting the ring apart instead. Pulled the pile, uh, the, the padding away. Pile drive Sting right on the plywood. Sting kicked out of that too. At this point, I figured the knife was sure to come into play again, but it did not. He took turns trying pile drivers and missing after we'd already seen two of them. 
Sting hit his uh, death drop on the exposed wood. At this point, the Aces and Aids all ran out and attacked him. Mike Tenet was very angry about this. He screamed, God damn it. So Sting fought off like eight dudes. He got hold of a chain. He clonked Bully with it, but Devon pulled out the ref. So Sting hit Devon with a chain. There's a lot of shit going on here. Either was. Anderson got a hammer into Ray, and Ray finally clonked Sting in the head with it and pinned him. And I can't call it a failure. The crowd was into it. All the run-ins and the wood and the knife and the hammer and the chain. But it was a overbooked mess on TV. And then... <laughs> Todd Kennelly, in what was apparently his last line as a TNA announcer, said, this is a quote, We'll see you on Impact. Damn it! <laughs> Which Todd is Kennelly, what Todd I always Kennelly, say when Impact Todd starts. Kennelly. I, uh... I wrote something in the update about Todd Kennelly. I got nothing against Todd Kennelly. I'm sure he's a nice guy and everything like that. This was not his job. He uh, he made mistakes all the time. Yeah. When you don't know when the pay-per-view is, when you keep talking about the pay-per-view this Sunday and there's no pay-per-view this Sunday because you got confused and it's actually the Sunday after, that ain't good. You know what I mean? And I don't know. I just uh, I was never into the whole Todd Kennelly thing. I, I never even understood it when he did it, wanting to just kind of switch things up. Problem with TNA is like they just can't figure out what the hell they want to do. You know, all the time switches, all the announcer switches. I mean, it's just everything is being switched back and forth, trying to find this, trying to find that. Problem's not your damn announcers or the time slot. You know, this was a good pay per view. I like this pay per view. I enjoy Impact most weeks. But at the end of the day, what the hell is going on in Impact? Anybody? What the hell's going on in Impact? I'm talking to you guys. I don't know. Silence. There's mm -hmm. silence in the room. Because there's nothing going on in Impact. Same guys doing the same matches. Same storylines. Same angles. I realize you're doing a slow build to a lot of different things and, and everything like that. But that's all fine and good. That's In fact, it's great. It's good to have a program doing long-term, slow build storylines. But... Just ain't working. Just ain't working. Maybe it'll work in the end. Right now, TNA just feels like a company that they put on TV. Mm -hmm. Four times a year, they put on pay-per-views. TV's over. You move on with your life, and you watch TV the next week. It feels like the reason they're doing wrestling shows is because, well, it's Thursday, and we do wrestling shows on Thursday. That's right. We're, we're contracted to do wrestling shows yes. every Thursday, so that's what we're going to do. We'll try and make them good. Lately, often they are. But there's a difference between having good shows and having shows that make people interested in the product and interested to see where you're going. And the only thing they got coming up this summer is this Bound for Glory tournament. And for the Bound for Glory tournament, there's actually, there's one guy in right now, Jay Bradley, <laughs> after a match with Sam Shaw. Oh, that's so depressing when you put it that way. That's your summer kickoff, everybody. That's your summer kickoff. I feel bad. I'd be nice if, like, uh, TNA was hot right now. But they ain't hot. And I don't see anything on the horizon that's going to turn it around. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they got a big angle coming up. But if they do, it involves Hulk Hogan. Which, good luck getting me involved in this angle with Hulk. Let's, uh, let's proceed with this, uh, this impact review. I don't, by the way, everybody, have any sort of update on what the hell happened to Jeff Hardy. But it appears he hurt himself. So, uh, I, pre I presume in the morning we'll have an answer. But it looked like he uh, hurt his back. Would be my, be my. Uh, maybe he didn't. Maybe that was the whole idea. Is, is when Bully Ray got backstage, they didn't want Jeff to get to him, and so they had to do some sort of injury angle. But that was kind of an odd way to do it. There would be. I would think there'd be better ways than to make Jeff look like a well numbskull, the clumsy, clumsy old, yes. old, yeah, F fragile. All right, let's let's uh, let's proceed. So, Bully Ray came out to brag about his win at the pay-per-view. Pointed out the last year at Slammiversary had been the first time Sting had been beaten up by Aces and Eights. We've been going through the storyline now for a year. He then bragged about beating Sting single-handedly at the pay-per-view this year. Said that Sting had threatened retirement. All because of the way Bully had beaten him. 
He said he deserved to be in the Hall of Fame. He called out Dixie. He got Hulk Hogan instead. He said Billy Ray had been at the top of, the, of his game at the pay-per-view pay dude. And that the Aces and Nates had been the ones to really beat Sting. <laughs> I, forgot, I did not write it down. There was a point in here we talked about Hogan's crazy promo at the pay-per-view, including words like pussies and bitch. Uh, he apparently got scolded because he said something very... He emphatically used a G-rated curse word here. Like, what the heck? Or something. Hogan? Yeah. No, he said B. That's right. Son the of letter a B. B. Son, Son of, of a B. B is what he called him. That's right. So, uh, to make a very long story short, he booked for tonight Bully Ray versus Jeff Hardy in a ladder match with a hammer hanging above the ring. It took him a long ass time to do this. It's a very strange match to book on the fly, but that is what they did. Chavo and Hernandez had a meeting backstage. Hold on a second. All right. You got an update? I'm trying to get an update. All I have are uh, four hours ago, which would have been, uh, what, would we, what would that be? Now that was before the match. Jeff Hardy just tweeted, thank you, Duluth. He's tweeted nothing since. Uh, of course, there's nothing on the uh, TNA website, except TNA website is, uh, is strongly uh, pushing, I swear to God they call it this, a must-watch ending. Not the ladder match, but the confrontation with Brooke and Hulk and Bully. That was like the fifth best thing on the show. A must, worse. must watch ending. That is a don't watch ending, everyone. You don't have to watch that. I've got more. I don't know how or why, but on the Impact Wrestling website, there are a number of advertisement banners here. The top one is Shop TNA, new items added with Taryn. Under that is YouTube, watch Impact videos online. And underneath that is God Almighty's my witness, WWE Live. Tickets starting at $25. July 6, Ocean City, Maryland. You've got to be kidding me. You've got to be kidding me. Go check this Sister out, myself, Vinny. actually. Go up to the Just, TNA Wrestling website. Yep, yep. It's loading right now. ImpactWrestling.com. And click on... Uh, Tickets. Click on News. And there you will see the must-see ending. Oh, now it's gone. Why are you being so slow? I see. They've got a uh, they've got an Google ad ad? server here. Yeah. And the ad server just randomly had a WWE live event ad on the TNA website. How hilarious, in fact. Next time it comes up, I'm going to get a screenshot if people don't believe me. You know, if you want to see the must-watch ending, if you go to this impactwrestling.com slash news, there's a still shot of Hogan, Ray, and Brooke all staring at each other. That is, in fact, the must-watch ending. Yeah. That's everything you need to see. I'm not joking. <laughs> That's all that happened. I should also note that in that opening segment when Bully Ray came out and he's talking about uh, this and that, and all of a sudden they played Hulk Hogan's music. I was... I finally... I finally... I don't know why it took so long. But I finally had just had enough. You know what I mean? Like, really? We're watching Hulk Hogan as a centerpiece of this promotion still. In 2013. I have been very tolerant for a long time. Yeah, Hogan's on the show. Yeah, he's he's a centerpiece. Yeah, it sucks. Yeah, it'd be better if it's someone else. But this was a night where it was really like, really? I am sick of this promotion being built around Hulk Hogan. And clearly, Hulk and Eric Bischoff think it's very important that Hulk is all over this show. Based on the fact that on the TNA website, the must-see ending of Impact is Hulk, Brooke, and Bully looking at each other. Who could possibly care about this storyline? Not me! No. So this is uh, nothing to do with anything, but speaking of uh, random ads and stuff, up at the very top, there's an ad from Udi's Gluten-Free Buns advertising, and I'm quoting this now, a $10,000 gluten-free disco barbecue. Yum. <laughs> Can't think of anything more... Uh... 
Delish. <laughs> Nothing says summer like a disco barbecue with no gluten. <sighs> Made me laugh. So, yeah, uh, that was the segment. So, Chava was meeting with Hernandez backstage. And this left me confused, although it was finally explained later. So, they are not tag champs now. And there is a uh, Battle for Glory series going on with 12 guys having a big big round-robin tournament and the winner getting a title shot. Now, that's 12 guys. The top 12 contenders, you would think, would all be in this tournament. And uh, then the champion is not in it. So basically, if you're not in this tournament, you really suck. So the guys who are tag champs for the past several months... Long story short, they're having a qualifier match for the tournament. Mm -hmm. One of them will finish outside the top 13 guys in the company. Meanwhile, Jay Bradley is in the tournament. Yeah. On the basis of one win over another gut check guy. Yeah. That's fucking stupid. I liked how in this little meeting they had, Hernandez wanted a handshake, and Chavo refused to shake his hand. So then they go to the ring, and the very first fucking thing they do is they shake hands. That happened. <laughs> Chavo, you don't remember what you just did backstage or in your pre-tape? Come on. Yeah, yeah, that happened. So, uh, yeah, Chavo's big thing here was Hernandez saying, you know, we're going to fight now, but I want to thank you for everything you've taught me. And that's when he offered his handshake, and Chavo backed off saying, I taught you a lot, but I didn't teach you everything. So they had their match, and here's where they explained that one of these men would not be in the tournament. And we found out later that, that next week there's more qualifiers. Like, AJ Styles and Kurt Angle are having a qualifying match. Yeah, you got to qualify to get into this tournament. Unless you're Jay Bradley. Well, he's still qualified. <laughs> I suppose. He beat Sam Shaw. I would argue that uh, even if AJ loses that match and uh, has only two match losing streak, he still has better credentials to get in than Jay Bradley. Well, now we know why Kurt Angle beat him clean at the pay-per-view. We do, in fact, have a clue as to that. So, uh, they had a fun match. Very clean. Both guys uh, clean all the way through. And Hernandez tried the border toss, but Chavo turned that into a roll-up. But Hernandez turned that into a roll-up and got the pin. And Chavo was all pissed off and upset because now he's not in the Maverick Glory series. And Jay Bradley is. I'd be pissed off, too. But eventually, he got over it. And he fist bumped uh, Hernandez and he raised his hands. So they're still buds. I uh, I presume that uh, AJ is going to win the whole thing and get a championship match, but maybe that's the idea that I'm supposed to assume that. And uh, I can actually see uh, Hernandez. I swear to God, I can see Hernandez winning the tournament and getting the shot at Bound for Glory. Can you now? Yeah. I know they've been high on Hernandez for a while. I heard like a year ago they were going to do something big with Hernandez, and then mm. they never did. So I don't, I don't rule it out. Stranger things have happened Strange, in this damn tournament. Stranger things have certainly happened. That's true. Quinn Rampage Jackson showed up on Impact. Mm -hmm. He introduced himself to Simon Diamond and Gunstorm. They all wished him good luck. Devon, Beer Gunny? Hmm? Beer Gunny. I like Gunstorm. I'm sticking with Gunstorm until uh, until they come up with something better. Devon came out, came out, claimed that his match with Abyss at the pay-per-view was never official. He never agreed to it. He demanded Abyss come out and return the TV title. He did not get Abyss. What he got was Joe Park, who came out in his track suit, and he was arguing emphatically, all lawyerly, and suddenly he did a I'll be charitable and call it a double leg takedown. A brawl broke out. It went badly for Joe. Devon got the better of him. The best part was uh, Joe on the floor, blatantly on camera, reaching into his uh, jacket pocket to pull out a gimmick. So Devon was getting him with a chair, but Abyss's music hit. And Abyss still didn't come out, and finally Devon said, Screw this. If you won't come to me, I'm going to go get you. And he left. And meanwhile, Joe Park came up bleeding from the mouth, and he started to. Breathe harder and harder, and like he was going to snap, he went to commercial. Which, by the way, we never saw Joe Park again. No, no, we did well, not. But we did see a very angry abyss. Yeah, weird, huh? Coincidence. Devon and Knox are shown walking the halls of the building, hunting for abyss. 
We had another Bound for Glory qualifier, Robbie E versus Samoa Joe. This is great. It's great for many reasons. First of all, Robbie E, the Jersey Shore guy, was very over in Atlanta. There are lots of people, people pumping their fists for him. Although, in hindsight, this may, they may have just thought he was Zack Ryder. I think they thought he was Fandango. That's also possible. He called himself the MVP of the 2012 Bound for Glory series because he had beaten Jeff Hardy and Jeff Hardy had won. I've heard worse arguments. Said he got five points in the tournament last year. I haven't heard many worse, but... He beat the guy who won. It's There's something to base it on. He amassed five points. Well, he did not do very well in his other 11 matches. That's true. He said he had five points last year. This year, he was going to get 20,000 points. As many as. Yes. He admitted he may only get five. It was, but, the, but, but he's not putting a cap on what he can do either. He's aiming high. He's getting zero. Well, he is, in fact, getting zero because Joe came out and destroyed him. Samoa Joe squashes are always fun. He hit the muscle buster and choked him out, and that was it. That was up. So we now the field at this point was Jay Bradley, Hernandez, and Samoa Joe. What a field. Yeah. Uh, Mickey apologized to Velvet Sky for not saving her last week. Her excuse was it was like a movie and everything was going in slow motion. I can believe that. Velvet said... Velvet didn't really care. She said, I accept your apology, but I want my rematch tonight. I had a little boy the other day in our Little Dragons jiu-jitsu class, and they do a warm-up that involves a little bit of gymnastics, some running, jumping, walking on a little bit of a low... We've got a low balance beam. It's about shin height. Kids walk across it. So one of these little boys is... is uh, He's doing bear crawls across the beam, which is a lot harder than you would think on a little... I can imagine, actually. ...four-inch beam or whatever it is. It's covered in leather. So uh, he's walking across doing bear crawls, and I'm kind of uh, kind of overseeing it. But, uh, you know, they go slow. Everything's fine. It's very low to the ground. There's mats underneath. It's very difficult to get hurt. But as he's walking, his, uh, his feet slip. And sure enough... Everything moved in slow motion, and there was that thought, like, I must jump in there and grab him. But, of course, all this is going through my mind, and I'm just frozen because time is standing still. And uh, I cannot get there in time, and he crotched the beam. Just stomach flat on the beam, legs one on each side, arms one on each side, and just splat. And I thought... Oh, God. But then I realized he's six, and uh, he was fine. He went, I'm all right! And he jumped right up, and he just kept going. I would have been like Bully Ray in the main event when he got that ladder drop kicked into his balls, as he noted, and I had never been the same again. But this kid was totally fine. Jumped right back up and kept bear crawling across. Kids are pretty amazing. And sometimes in slow motion. That's right. So I agree with Mickey James. There was nothing that could be done. Time stood still. She could not possibly have saved Velvet Sky. So Velvet wanted her uh, title rematch tonight, but Mickey said, Sorry, I can't. I already have a match with a challenger that you overlooked when you were champion. They aired uh, Kurt Angle's Hall of Fame video. And after that, coincidentally, it was time for Quentin Rampage Jackson to come out for a promo. They uh, had some very generic music with some wolf howls mixed in. This was a perfect debut for Quentin. Yes. He was a superstar. Yes. He came out. This place went absolutely nuts. Mm -hmm. It was they actually awesome because he was he was out on the ramp and looking into the camera and being all scary, as we have all seen hundreds of times, and stopping to howl. And uh, then he would see very young children in the aisle and high-five them. This guy's <laughs> already better at being a pro wrestler than he was at being a fighter. It's his uh, first yeah. night in. Yeah, yeah. Everyone cheered. They 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 just saw him as a big fucking deal in the impact. Zone. He was a, he was a star. Or wherever they he were. was he, he was definitely a star. So uh, Boras was there to interview him. He did fine, except he, at first he actually had the mic too far from his mouth, but he got that figured out. That's an easy problem to fix. And he's bringing Joe Rogan to hold the mic for him. Exactly. Uh, 
<laughs> so he ex- talked about growing up a wrestling fan in Memphis, which is why he used to do all those big slams in his fights. Before, he says he got addicted to knocking people out. I miss the big slams, personally. He said he, then, big uh, slams were a lot easier against smaller men. Uh, smaller men, and yeah, and, and, and they really don't often work that well. <laughs> so, um, he, he was being very uh, low-key up to this point, and then he got a little more serious, a little more intense, and he said he came to TNA to be the best, and that meant he had to beat the best. As he said this, out came Kurt Angle. Quinn had an amazing amount of. Uh, he was just very good at this. He's yeah, well, yeah. We none of us should be surprised. Well, I can kind of be a little bit surprised. I mean, he was. Everything was unscripted back in in uh, MMA. This was a bunch of scripted stuff. He had to know. He had he had a lot of poise. He had to he yes. had to react properly to this yes. stuff that was coming. He had to. He did a great job. He. I see your point, uh, but it's not. They, they did not give him like a ten-minute promo to memorize. They asked him a question with a, a simple answer, and a, it led into a challenge. He then basically had to act like a tough guy. This was awesome. Well, we'll see what happened, but this was awesome because it was all so simple. So Angle comes out, and uh, as soon as the two men laid eyes on each other, they knew shit was on. Kurt said, "Look, you may be the best in the cage, but I'm the best in this ring." When you think you're ready, you'll have to go through me. And they stared each other down, and the place was just pissing themselves. Everyone in the building was just going nuts. Then they relaxed a bit, and they shook hands like they were professional fighters who had just done business. Not like they were not like they were friends or buddies or laughing at it off, but like they had just finished like a photo shoot or something. Uh, but as soon as they shook hands, Rampage pulled them in tight and stared them down again. And Kurt looked just a little bit surprised. Perhaps he'd underestimated this man. And finally, they released hands and they went their separate ways. And this was tremendous, tremendous stuff. I, I hope it goes somewhere. Well, you never know. But as for, uh, yes, as for Quentin Jackson's debut on Impact Wrestling, it could not have gone any better. Maybe someday they'll wrestle. We'll see. I'm still skeptical of Rampage going to Kentucky. I find that very unlikely as well. I will say that uh, if he's going to have a match, Angle's probably the best guy to have it with. Because Kurt will just say, most guys will say you have to work light or lighten up. Kurt will say, just don't hit me as hard as you can. Let's wrestle, and then you powerbomb me. Pretty much. And yeah. then I'll ankle lock you, and then we'll have a schmoz. Easy. And I would, I, that sounds awesome. That sounds great. Bully Ray and Mr. Anderson had a conversation about D'Lo being kicked out of the group. Anderson said that if D'Lo was gone, that means we need a vice president. Maybe it should be me. Uh, Bully didn't answer him. He just started bitching about his match with Jeff and how unfair it was. And he started bitching about the fact that there was not an ace and isn't the aces and eights did not, did not have a guy in the Bound for Glory series. So uh, Anderson asked if he wanted any interference in the main event tonight. And Ray said a good vice president could make that decision on his own. He walked away, and Anderson says, so does that mean I'm the vice president? An idiot. Dumbass. It either means yes, or it means we'll see how you do tonight. But it did not mean, ask me another question. Austin Aries and Bobby Roode and Kenny King versus Gunstorm and Chris Saban. They did not have a ton of time, unfortunately. What we got was very good. Heat on uh, Storm. And as he's crawling into the corner for the hot tag, the crowd was chanting, We want Gunner. They got Gunner, who looked absolutely enormous this evening. Uh, he made a big comeback. Everyone took, tur- took turns hitting big moves. And Saban finally pinned King with the Cradle Brain Buster, which they are apparently calling the All Hail Saban. We want Gunner. I don't know why that was so funny. I have nothing against Gunner. In I, fact, like, I like Gunner. Gunner's it's just, pretty good. It's just a stupid name. It's just astonishing that they're chanting, We want Gunner. Yeah. This was a, this was a successful segment. Uh, Devon and Nas continue their hunt. Apparently what if they called him Tommy Gunner? Building. I would consider that an improvement. Hmm. 
Brooke Hogan congratulated Taryn Terrell on her pay-per-view match. Taryn basically said, a thank you. By the way, are you still in love with Bully Ray? And she said it in such a way that, like... <laughs> she said it in like, the same way as, you know, what did you have for lunch today? She said it in a way that, like, she didn't want Brooke to think it was the only thing she cared about. But her delivery was such that it was the only thing she actually cared about. <laughs> yeah. So, um... Brooke awkwardly explained that she did not want to talk about that. She only wanted to talk about wrestling. And Taryn said, oh, of course. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have asked. And she walked away. I just thought this was awesome because I can honestly see uh, Taryn Terrell being clueless enough to ask this question and not think it would be a big deal. Yeah. Mickey James wrestled Taylor Hendricks. This is the woman that... Uh, the champion or the challenger that Velva had been ducking. Yes. Taylor Hendricks. So the good news is the fans were going crazy during this match. Raucous, rowdy, loud, having a grand old time. The bad news is they were chanting Cena sucks and then yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, what are you going to do? So the match was, uh, it was good and exactly what you would expect considering what Mickey is doing. A lot of clean wrestling, but Mickey couldn't get the better of her. And then when she finally got frustrated, she feigned a knee injury. She hit Taylor with a sucker slap and hit a bad spin kick for the win. Taylor and I like Mickey's. Uh, I like her uh, character right now. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong about this, but Mickey has entered the. Uh, I don't care, and so I'm much better now. Aspect of her career. Could be. Looks like she's out there just having fun. I am, like, here I am just going me. to be an annoying uh, fake baby face, and I'm just going to have fun. I don't give a shit. And she's better. Yeah. Much like, for example, Chris Jericho of late. It's yeah. kind of the same way. He's 42. He doesn't need this anymore. He does it for fun. It's not the be-all and end-all. And he's a million times better as a result. It's like when Batista was going to leave. He was he was on his way out. He didn't give a shit. He had his money. He just went out there and had fun. And goddamn, he was awesome. Same thing now with Mickey James. She's, uh, you know, how, how high are you going to go in TNA? Not that high, right? No higher than she is right now. She's got uh, she's got her band. She's got her music. She's she's at the Country Music Awards or whatever. Now she's just out there on Impact, just having fun. And she's great. So more power to Mickey James. We saw Abyss's shadow beat up Knox's shadow in the parking lot, which was awesome. Yep. And uh, we then saw the real Abyss jump the real Devon and lay him out as well. Abyss's shadow should have been uh, uh, Joe Park's shadow. No long hair. <laughs> nothing. You just see you just see Joe Park's shadow destroyed Knox, and then all of a sudden Abyss runs in and, and beats up Devon with the mask and the wig on. That's my theory. They showed Sting losing the pay per view, and then they showed a whiny Sting tweet from this afternoon. Whiny? <laughs> well, exactly. A completely justified tweet. <laughs> This poor guy was screwed. He had no friends. Nobody came to help him, as everyone noticed, and uh, and and apparently he's pissed. Yeah. Good for Sting. <laughs> By the way, Sting's Twitter. It says right here. Sunday, I was left to fight alone. Message received. Yeah. This, by the way, was his first tweet since March twenty eighth. Which was his first tweet since December 6th. That's three tweets in seven months. Six months. Go Sting Go! And I should add that if you go back even further, he has not done a lot of tweets. Let me just look at this very quickly. He had a March 28th, December 6th, November 22nd, when he said it, Happy Thanksgiving. October 13th, when he tweeted twice, believe it or not. And then on August 26th, 
He tweeted about eight times, and uh, they go as follows. Tweet number one. Warming up on the driving range and putting greens, putting greens. Last night's gala was great. Thanks again. Which then we see a series of tweets that say, for example, hole seven, one under. Hole nine, two under. Hole 12, four under. He tweeted all these things in August and then gave up until October. This is an amazing Twitter. And somehow he got at Sting. That is amazing. I'm baffled. What about the other Sting? The musician? Yeah. Maybe he's not using it. Is that? Clearly he's not using it. Maybe that's official Sting. Looks like that. Yep. Looks like. Yeah. Official Sting. Is the uh, artist. And at Sting is Sting. So there you go, everybody. Sting's mad. He'll be there next week. So it's time for the main event. Jeff Hardy versus Bully Ray in a hammer atop a ladder match. <laughs> yes. Sorry. There's a list of various stings. There's Sting, official Sting, a fake at Sting TNA. Sting stung me. I don't even know what that means. Honey Bee Sting. And finally, Yogi Sting. There is a yogi named Sting who has 8,000 followers. A bunch of pictures of him doing yoga. He, he actually looks like the other Sting, not the wrestler. About that. All right, go on. All right. Uh, so it's Bully Ray and Jeff Hardy. They brawled on the floor, brawled on the floor a lot, and they brawled in the ring a lot. By and large, you know, as far as ladder matches go, this is one of the safest you'll ever see. They were doing things like they, no one got slammed onto the ladder, and most of the time when Jeff fell off the ladder, he would land on his feet and then into the ropes or something. There was one great spot where Bully had to uh, he had to take a bump a, a bump seated down in the corner for a spot. But the ladder was in the way. <laughs> so you've never seen a man be so careful to run across the ring without tripping over the ladder first. So he ended up down there and Jeff kicked the ladder into his crotch. And Bully responded by turning to Taz at the announce desk and screaming. And this is a quote. Taz! My balls! I uh, don't know if I'm just a mark, but uh, I, I think that Bully took that ladder a little too hard in the balls. He sold this for like 10 minutes. And it didn't even play in anything later on in the match. It was just like for about 10 minutes after that ladder went into his balls, he was grabbing his balls. Like every every 10 seconds, he would just stop what he was doing and grab his balls. So hopefully he did not like... Lose a ball? Bust his balls. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, maybe, maybe a swift kick to the balls with that ladder. A little too hard. And then uh, Jeff at the end... Everyone seems to think he was just selling, but that was weird. I mean, I understand maybe they needed to have him sell because they didn't want him backstage when There's Hulk... There's got to be a better way to get him out of the picture than what they did. I think he really hurt himself. But again, maybe I'm a numbskull. We'll find out in the morning. So, yeah, the finish was Ray finally got the hammer. Uh, before he could use it, though, Jeff hit him with a stunner. And Ray sold the stunner by tossing into the, the hammer into the air as high as it was possible possibly go. I thought it would get stuck in the roof or something and not come down. Uh, fortunately, it came down in the ring. So Jeff got it, and he went after Ray a few times, but Ray dodged and ran away. And Jeff Hardy started to give chase, and he got about two steps up the ramp when suddenly he went down grabbing at his ass. His buttock. I thought it was a sacrum. Sure. Uh, there's a number of things it could be, but it did not look like your uh, one of their top baby faces had done anything, you know, noteworthy to be injured. It looked like he just was clumsy and fragile and fell and broke himself. And was too old and broken to get back up. So he lay there for a while. Camera stayed on him the whole time, left him suffering and immobile and unable to get to his feet. And finally he had to call the ref over to help him. I mean, he looked bad here. If this is what they had planned, this is insane to me. So the ref helped him up, and finally they cut backstage where there's Bully Ray by himself. 
and uh, he's sweaty and tired and sore, and he's crying about where his belt is. And Who cares where your damn belt is. <laughs> You're still the champion. What does there's, it matter? There's a lunatic chasing you with a back. hammer. <laughs> and suddenly Hulk Hogan appears, and Bully's all scurred. And I guess he thought Hulk was going to kill him or something. And suddenly Brooke came running in, screaming, no, no, don't do it, don't do it. And they all stared at each other in confusion, and they went off the air. And this ending that TNA said on their website was must-see was actually pretty damn lame. I just so don't care about Hulk Hogan, Brooke, and Bully. No. I don't even know how it's possible to. I'm sick of the Hulkster. I'm sick of seeing the Hulkster as the main event on this show. It's 2013. Halfway to 2014, for the love of God. Time to... Time to move on, everybody. This this is not must-see television with Hulk Hogan all over the show. Let's have a good Bound for Glory series. Have a bunch of great matches. Try and make some stars. Try and get AJ Styles over. James Storm. Bobby Roode. Austin Aries. Any of these guys. I am done with Hulk Hogan. I know it's going to make Thrasher very upset. I don't care. Thrasher, he'd be more over if he only showed up twice a year anyway. Anyway. That was the Impact show, everyone. That was Impact. We'll find out how uh, Jeff Hardy is as soon as possible. Hopefully he's all right. Maybe it is just uh, selling. Who knows? But, uh, yeah. What a, what a return. I do love the... I do love whenever you've got something on a pole match or hanging from the ceiling. And the rules are whoever grabs it gets to use it. And invariably, one guy grabs it and then the other guy uses it on him. That does seem to be the pattern. Yeah. That kind of... Kills the gimmick, but I guess that's wrestling. That's how it's been done for a long time now. Well, shit. Let's get started. Hogan came out, said an act of God had stopped him from bashing in Bully Ray's skull with a hammer last week. He said he had banned Brooke from the show, and people booed. And my theory is that they booed because this was taped, a tape show, and so when he said, she's banned this week... They all said, wait a minute, she was just here ten minutes ago. Wishful thinking. Mm. They booed because they all like Brooke Hogan. <laughs> Some lonely men in Atlanta. So this brought up, or uh, uh, Hulk, Hulk kept talking, said they're going to finish the Bound for Glory series selections tonight. Joe Hernandez and Jade Bradley were all in, and I was stunned that Hogan remembered all of their names. He did. Seriously, Hulk Hogan said Jay Bradley's name in the wrestling ring. And remembered it. And remembered it. Which was good, because he couldn't remember anything else on this show. Yeah. When he tried to explain, I'll just cut to the chase. Hardy and Rude came out, and and next week something's happening. What? I have absolutely (laughs) no idea. Fans, Hogan said, can, I swear to God he said this, call in, because I guess there's like an 800 number to TNA or a hotline. Sure. They can call in, or they can Twitter, or he said, whatever, and vote between Jeff and Bobby Roode. For what? I have absolutely no idea. I did not figure this out until an hour and a half later into the show, when they announced that fans are going to vote on who of these two men gets the first call-out in open fight night. If any of you could possibly give a fuck which guy gets the first call-out in open fight night... Please email it to me and explain why this matters one bit. And by the way, at the end of the day, he threw out the website address. So it's not Twitter and it's not Colin, it's the website. This was amazing, Hulk Hogan. Seriously, though, it's open fight night, and Bobby Roode and Jeff Hardy apparently both get to call someone out. Yeah. I presume to try to win a spot in the tournament. No, they're both already in. They're both already in? Yeah. So they just get a chance to call someone out. Yeah. So we get to vote about who in a two-hour show gets to do it first? Not just that, but from the impression of what they uh, said to each other here, it was implied they were going to call each other out anyway. In fact, Bobby Roode outright said, I'm going to call you out. And Hardy did not back down. So so, so we're voting on which guy gets to to actually physically call out the other guy. Yeah. This is the dumbest poll in the history of wrestling. <laughs> I can't think of anything better. So the Aces and Eights came out. Bully demanded they get a guy in the tournament. It's possible, I should add, that it's actually something much better, but Hulk Hogan has no idea what he's talking about. We should be fair. Yeah. Bully Ray demanded that uh, his gang get a spot in the tournament. Hulk said, fine. 
You get one spot. Are we going to have a battle royal tonight? And your guys are going to have to fight each other for it. And Ray ordered Wes Briscoe and Garrett Bischoff to attack Bobby Roode and Jeff Hardy. That went badly. And uh, the TNE guys cleared the ring. And then Roode cheap shotted Hardy from behind and bailed. And that was the opening segment. Hmm. Right over there? I'm just sighing. Bad Influence cut an awesome promo involving a piano. I can never do this justice, but they made fun of Gunner's beard and James Storm's heartbreak. And they vowed that one of them would win the BFG series and then go on to win the title. Bad Influence versus Gunstorm in a non-title tag team qualifier for the Bound for Glory series. Just a match. Not a lot of time. And uh, Kazarian pinned Storm with a belt shot. Gunner had a really cool fallaway slam at one point. And that's all I got to say. Yeah. Crimson arrived. Yes. Crimson. Just back with no explanation. Velvet had an envelope that she said would make everyone happy. In hindsight, she was wrong. It's not what you expected, everyone. It was not topless photos. Or a nude pictorial. Crimson uh, then hit the ring. This was amazing. Crimson explains that he was undefeated for over 400 days. He suffered one loss, and he was sent home for a year. Yes. Thanks for reminding us what a gigantic loser you are. Here is the storyline. How shitty their booking is. And by the way, this, this win streak, if you guys remember this win streak, this was one of the worst win streaks of all time. So he explains that he was he won 400 matches in a row, and then he was sent home for a year. He proceeds to be given a match with Joe Park for a slot in the Bound for Glory tournament. Why? I have absolutely no idea. If you if you go by why did they send the guy home? Let's pretend this is real. He won 400 days in a row, and then they sent him home. Why did they do that? If the guy won 400 straight days in a row. Because they're stupid. So if they sent him home after that, why did they then bring him back a year later and put him in a tournament for a shot at the title? Because they needed somebody to job to Joe Park. Joe Park beat him. Yeah. So after all that, Crimson was beaten. I just like the, the idea. There that were some burials on this show, and this was one of them. One of these two men was guaranteed a spot in the tournament. And meanwhile, Kurt Angle and AJ Styles, only one of them can get in. Yeah. There's no logic to uh, the, the, these qualifiers. Mickey gave herself a uh, pep talk in the mirror. Velvet came out. She was much better than Stephanie McMahon on Raw. This is not high praise. She explained that her friendship with Mickey had been up in the air. She called Mickey out to see what was in the envelope. Mickey came out. Velvet said, this is medical clearance from my doctor. It means I am healthy to wrestle and I demand my rematch. Mickey then said that you can get fake Stuff from doctors on the internet all the time. <laughs> she should have said prescriptions, but yes. Then she said the paperwork is dated yesterday, and there's clearly still something wrong with your knee today. And then she kicked a velvet in the knee and put her in a wacky, but very cool, leg lock, chin lock submission hold. And the rest came out to break it up. And if there was any lingering doubt, Mickey's a heel now. Yeah. And uh, she was awesome here, actually. Enjoy. She was great. And uh, her, her new character is awesome, and this, this angle worked. So, I guess, I guess Velvet's healthy again. We'll see. Matt Morgan cut a promo backstage. First, he started talking about Sting. And I have no idea why. I thought I, he was fighting Sting tonight. I'm sure Matt Morgan's a nice guy. But why is this man employed? Like, weeks go by with no Matt Morgan. And then suddenly Matt Morgan's beard and cape appear on Impact. He cuts a promo about how he's never used properly. And then he proceeds to go out and get beaten. At which point he disappears again. Right. What are you paying him and why are you doing so? Matt Morgan's beard, first of all. It's we, uh, longer and wider than his own head. It's astounding. And then he has the cape. Which is uh, this cape? He looks like he's he's. It's look like if you're gonna do a Wizard of Oz play, 
And he is the great and powerful Oz. That is exactly what Lance Storm said. He's got a... Po- Only he meant the wrestler Oz. Posturous cape and this big-ass beard. And he walks out of the ring in 2013 in this getup. Yeah. He looks absolutely ridiculous. Yes. So... And he's orange in the front and white on the back. <laughs> it was, for no good reason, a four-way Bound for Glory qualifier with Magnus, Rob Terry, Kenny King, and Matt Morgan. What a crew. What What a lineup. What a match this was to <laughs> be booked. names drawn from a hat. Okay, first of all, the big dude started, and it's very, very clear that at this point, as I stand here in uh, or sit here in June of 2013, Rob Terry is substantially better at pro wrestling than Matt Morgan. <laughs> yes, it's abundantly clear. There were lots of edits in this match. It was not just for the big dudes. King and uh, Magnus were fucking stuff up too. And it got to this. The usually in a mat- matches like this, they, they have what I like to call the parade of finishers, where one guy hits a big move and then just turns around and he gets hit by somebody else's big move, and that guy turns around. This one, I think, is what they were going for, but I cannot call it a parade of finishers, so I just called it a clusterfuck. And somewhere in here, Magnus pinned King with a Michinoku driver. So Magnus is in the Bound for Glory tournament. Matt Morgan Great. Is, is not. Magnus was the most liked guy in this entire thing. And uh, and he was the best worker, Yeah, and the right man won. That's all true. Eric Young cut a promo backstage plugging his fishing show, and then he ran to the bathroom. Sting came out for a promo. Said Slam Anniversary 2012, he went into the Hall of Fame. <laughs> Slam Anniversary 2013, he got beat up by a bunch of guys. He lost to Billy Ray. He can never challenge for the title again. And worst of all of all this is that as he was being beaten up by a wave after wave after wave of men, nobody came out to help him because he has no friends. <laughs> what a sad promo. So he said he's going to follow the Aces and Nate's lead. He was going to get himself a family, and he was going to make a new main event mafia. Can't wait. Please do not bring back Kevin Nash and Scott Steiner. Booker is employed elsewhere. So it's just going to be Sting and Kurt, apparently. I'm baffled you remember any of the members of the main event mafia. I have no good explanation. Maybe Jarrett was in there, too. Actually, bring him back. I like that they tried to make sense of the fact that nobody came out to help Sting. Mm -hmm. But when this thing was over... The question still remains. Why the hell did no one come out to help Sting? There are a bunch of dicks. I never got an explanation for it. Eric Young versus Austin Aries in a Bound for Glory qualifier. Awesome! It was. Uh, This was a great match. First of all, wasn't there some big controversy where like he either almost or actually did quit the company because they wouldn't let him do or let him plug his fishing show? It was all over this show, which is fine. And they showed a clip of this show where he went to a bar made of ice in Minnesota, forgetting that his wife, ODB, lives in Minnesota. And they ran into each other there, and she attacked him. And uh, this segment looked more fun than anything we had seen up to this point on this Impact show. That did not last long, because this match was awesome. It is kind of amazing what they're doing with Eric. They uh, didn't let him do his show. Then they brought him, they, he was gone for months. He came back for the one, uh, the, the cage match with lockdown. He was gone for months again. They brought him back, plugged his show, put him in a prominent match, and gave him a lot of time to show what he could do. Yeah. This company is so bizarre sometimes. They had a hell of a pro wrestling match. Austin Aries won clean with the corner dropkick and the brain buster. Yay, you two men! This was a great match. Eric Young's been gone forever. He comes back and has a great match. Of course, it was Austin Aries. That's pretty easy. But uh, it was it was a, it was an excellent showing. This it was a two man show. Yes, Eric looked great. This was great. This was great. I wouldn't mind Eric Young if he just came back and, just and did wrestled this. like this. He's it's, actually been funny of late as well. You, you, the the old comedy was like stupid. I don't ever need to see him locking up with refs again. No, but this was pretty good comedy of late, and he had a great match. So thumbs up to Eric Young. Yeah. Aces and Nates had a meeting. It was kind of joint in progress. It was not totally clear what was going on, but it was obvious that uh, Doc disagreed with the rest of them, and they put it to a vote, and everyone said yes, and Doc was the last guy, and he kind of reluctantly agreed to vote yes, and that was it. Then he took a big swig of beer, and he produced a long, loud belch, and they just left it in there. 
Saban cut a promo talking about his last comeback. He had almost beaten Austin Aries. And then shortly thereafter, Aries went on to cash in the X title and win the world title. Then he said he wasn't sure if he should do that. Well, he wasn't sure if he should risk giving up the X title what for a one shot. What a stupid question. Of course he should. It's the X title. Who cares? Well, he fought very hard to get it back, Vinny. He could lose that world title match, and then he'd have nothing. He has nothing now. That's fine with He has the X title. That's fine with this. Aces and Nate's Battle Royal. So it turned out, they, they later explained that uh, Ken Anderson had drawn the high card or whatever, so he was it was pitched that he would win. So six dudes get in there, and the uh, <laughs> for about ten seconds, they all just circled each other. <laughs> A six-way circle. And then Anderson pointed his finger at Wes and said, bang! And Wes grabbed his chest like he had been shot and thrown himself and threw himself over the top rope. A and, finger poke of doom battle royal, everyone. Yeah. He did all the wacky eliminations, and finally it was come down to Anderson and Doc. And Doc refused to be eliminated by Anderson's wacky magic fingers. And everyone started screaming at him, and they had a short brawl, and then Anderson kicked his ass and eliminated him anyway. What a fucking loser. This may have been the biggest... This was a bigger burial than yeah. uh, Crimson. Much. He made a giant... He ran wild on this guy, and then Anderson just bloop, threw him out. Yep. Like a numbskull. Yep. So Anderson's in the Battle for Glory series. Quentin Drampage Jackson met with Angle backstage. Seemed a little miffed that Kurt had said he was not ready last week. Kurt said, look, if I stepped into a Bellator cage, you would kill me. If you step in that ring right now, I would kill you. If you train for a while and you prepare and you know how to fight in that, in that ring, we'd have a better match. Because That's not exactly what he said. <laughs> pro wrestling is not supposed to be a mixed martial art just in a ring and not a cage. Well, there's pins. Totally different. Sure. That's a nitpick. You're not wrong. That's a nitpick. Kind of got it, but it's not like Rampage does basketball. He was <laughs> no, a basketball I player. I understand. He was a mixed martial arts fighter. Yes. I understand him saying, I'm not ready, homie. Yeah. Kurt's like, you must train. Rampage just said, you know I hate training. That's true. Kurt just said, you can't run the ropes. All the Aces and Nates guys shouted at Doc backstage. Doc tried to put the heat on AJ for turning them down. He vowed to take AJ out. Ray said, you better get that done. AJ Styles versus Kurt Angle in the last Mount for Glory qualifier. Nothing like a, uh, a, a seventh quarter hour where they assure you there's going to be a run-in in the main event. Yeah. Especially when the main event is Kurt Angle versus AJ Styles. That's a way to make me tune in. <laughs> The main event is AJ and Kurt, but don't worry, there's going to be a run-in. So yeah, with a better finish, this actually would have been better than Eric and, and uh, Austin Aries. As it was, it was still awfully good. Better than their pay-per-view match not that long ago. And finally, Aces and Ace tried to attack, but Angle and AJ fought them off. Then AJ schoolboyed, schoolboyed Angle and won. So basically the exact same uh, finish to this match as finished the opening segment. Are they trying to tease that AJ and Ace and Nates are together, or was I just, uh, it was very... I suppose they could. It's kind of played up that way, that Ace and Nates interfered, and it led immediately to AJ getting the pin. Yeah. I would hope not, just because he just turned them down like a month ago. A stranger things have happened. So they all started beating up uh, Kurt, and AJ just left, and Rampage ran down with his chain to make the save. And the show ended with him standing tall next to Kurt Angle in the ring. And the uh, last half hour or so of this show was great. Well, you had the you had the great uh, Aries Eric Young match. You yeah. had the great main event. Yeah. The uh, Sting had a lot of passion. Uh, really, it was just those two matches. That about covers it. Gunner yeah. had a good fallaway slam. <laughs> Magnus won. There were some positives. I could have done without the finger poke battle royal. I'm still not even sure what's going on. So the idea is that Bully wants one guy in there to beat everybody. And then like... And then do a finger poke title match. I see. That's what he wants. Yeah. Uh, about that. So shouldn't he pe pick the... I don't know. 
I guess I guess that makes sense. I won't anyone who would be willing to lie to lie down for him. TNA didn't realize that when they put him on the battle royal, this was exactly what they'd do. I won't nitpick. <laughs> the answer is no. It's not my job. <laughs> Impact was uh, a bad show this week. Lots of stupidity, not much wrestling, and uh, a very, very bad segment with Brooke Hogan. Here's how the show began. Sting was in a suit, walking down a ramp. Mm -hmm. And he walked, 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 and the camera went to black. Like 20 seconds of a man walking. Hell of an open. Then they aired a Bound for Glory series promo video talking about how 12 men were going to all fight each other with only one could emerge as a victor. And the very first thing they showed was Bobby Roode winning the first Bound for Glory series and then losing in the championship match. Heartbreak. That's what they were fighting for. A the chance, possibility for heartbreak. The chance to fail on the biggest possible stage. They showed the opening, by the way, when Hogan came out for the first segment. And uh, usually they do a really good job of filming to make the place look like it's big and packed. They screwed up here. This building looks small and empty. I wouldn't say empty, but it looked like maybe 1,500 people. It looks small and lots of open seats. The uh, hard camera side looked absolutely completely empty. Uh, which usually they are very careful not to show that. But it, it, Well, the funny thing was about I don't know, two minutes later, they tried the exact same shot and did a much better job. Yeah. Oh, well. So, Hulk had all the Bound for Glory guys out there. And uh, he said that Hardy and Rude, they had done fan polling because it was open fight night. And the fans could vote on which of these wrestlers would be the first one to call somebody out. So, Hardy won. Aries said, you should pick me. Daniel said, you shouldn't pick me. And didn't matter because Hardy picked Rude, and that was that. So this all went on way too long. Talk about handing over the rating to the NBA. Oh, there's more to come. I was ready to watch the basketball game. This segment went on forever. There's just a bunch of guys in the ring. Hogan trying desperately to attempt to explain this. And listen, maybe I missed something. It's very possible. But. Was there any explanation as to why anybody got to call out anybody else? No. You, the, 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 only, the only thing they announced was they did announce it would be either Hardy or Rude going first. After that, it was all up in the air. But they didn't go first. It was just announced they would be facing each other. But they, they could go first as in uh, one of them would get to be the first person to call somebody out. But they ended up calling each other out. Yeah. Hmm. So, yes, uh, that, that'll that happen. If the story is that it was fan voting that allowed people to call each other out, I don't believe that because you're telling me that fans voted for Mr. Anderson to have a chance to call somebody out? No, only, only the first one was fan voting. It would take, like, 30 seconds to do a deal backstage where maybe the guys pull a number out of a hat or or they did one show one time where I believe if you won a match on Thursday's show, then you got to do a call-out on the next week's show. One time, I believe, they did this. That was the only time in the history of this open fight night that it, this has made any sense whatsoever. Why did Anderson get to call someone out and not Joe Park? Don't know. Why did uh, Jay Bradley get to call someone out and not Austin Aries? Don't know. I, I just... It, it drives me nuts because it would be so easy to just give an explanation. I, I, I hate the theory that... Wrestling fans don't think, so we don't have to give them an explanation. Actually, you know what? They do think. And, and what and they usually think is, this is stupid. They get upset when you treat them like they're numbskulls. So just come up with some sort of explanation for why people get to call out other people. That's all I ask. Just give me a reason for it. That's all I ask. They are once again doing an absurdly complicated scoring system. I'm very sad we did not get a Hulk Hogan promo trying to explain this. That's understandable. You get a submission, you get 10. You get a pinfall, you get 7. Are you doing this from memory or do you have it written down? I, I remember it. Really? From last year, actually. DQ is 2. 
Uh, getting DQ'd is zero, I believe. No, actually. The, this There's is, a minus two. This is the only thing I remember because it's hysterical. Getting disqualified is minus ten. Minus ten. Which is huge. Yeah. So if somebody you don't even know has nothing to do with you, runs out and beats up your opponent, you get disqualified. Listen, I don't care about the point system. If they want to do some sort of complicated point system, that's fine. As long as I get the stats every week and I have the announcers explain to me the importance of what's happening. Like it was it was made clear on this show, hey, this guy's trying to get a submission because he'll get ten points. You know what I mean? Okay. As long as next week they have everybody's name and how many points they have, and when we have a guy who has eight points against a guy who has ten points or something like that, they explain that, hey, if this guy gets a submission, he pulls out ahead of the pack, whereas if he gets a pinfall, he doesn't. As long as there's someone to explain that to the audience, I don't care about a, a complicated scoring system. Mr. Anderson came out, and uh, for some reason, the guy in Aces and Eights got the call out of TNA guy. He chose Joe Park. They had a match. It was short. Park still got blown up by the end. He had a Boston Crab on, but Doc came out and distracted the ref, and that broke up the hold. And then when Joe went up to the ropes, Doc kicked him in the head from the apron, which was actually very impressive. And uh, Anderson hit the mic check for the win. I have a pet peeve in wrestling. It's not, even, it's not even, well, I have many of them, but this is one of them. It's not even TNA that does this. But when you're doing a match and a heel outside the ring interferes and it doesn't lead to the finish, and then he just interferes again, and this time it does lead to the finish. Yeah. It's like, why don't you just have it lead to the finish the first time? So you can have a near fall that nobody cares about in the opener with Joe Park and Mr. Anderson. I don't know. Wasn't a fan of this. Then, after working together in perfect harmony to win a match, seconds later, Doc and Anderson were screaming at each other backstage about who should be the vice president of the Aces and Eights. Why should I care? Well, the other question is, why would they care? Do you That's get a, frankly a good question more girls? Well. Do you get more money? A bigger do you bike? get more beer? What do you get by being the vice president? So, Bully Ray told them to shut up and said there would be a vote among the Aces and Eights crew. Jay Bradley, for some reason, got to call somebody out. Chose Austin Aries, told him to come on out and get boomsticked. So he said. That's the exact words. That's his finish, the boomstick. They had a fun match and it was competitive. They did, they did not squash the new guy. Aries got the win with a very scary brain buster. Aries is small. Bradley is big. And Aries looked like he was struggling mightily to keep this big guy under control for this brain buster. And he dropped him on his head and then looked right at him as he made the pin to make sure he was still breathing in and out. I like uh, Jay Bradley, but absolutely nobody cared about this match. It's a sad thing. He had a main event Mafia video, which is funny because right now nobody isn't. And Sting promised that the, that the Mafia would grow tonight. Chavo gave Hernandez a pep talk backstage. Then he was never seen again. Then Hernandez called out Daniels, who did not strut down to the ring. So that takes a star away from the match right there. Then they had a short match, and Hernandez, who called this man out, got hit in the nuts and pinned with a big, uh, the best best moonsault ever. What a loser Hernandez turned out to be. Well, I, 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 listen, I like clean finishes on my wrestling shows. <laughs> Great! We got a lot of them on this show here tonight, except for the one I wanted to see the most. He had a low blow. <laughs> I actually, uh, does that count as a clean finish anymore? I can't even tell. It does. He right. pinned the guy. There's no interference. So then, next segment, Kazarian called out Magnus, and after a short match, Magnus beat him with a Texas clover Cloverleaf. What a loser cast turned out to be. Vinny, the idea is that we're getting clean finishes here in this tournament. It happened last year, too. We can't just have a bunch of DQs and countouts. It's not, that, it's, not the, uh, it's that the person doing the calling out keeps losing. I see. Repeatedly. I made see. It those two times. Happened back to back. Well, then, yeah, they, they, they made poor decisions. <sighs> Bully Ray and Hulkster had a confrontation. Hulk said that Ray and Brooke were done, and Ray said, if that's true, then why didn't she stop you from hitting me in the head with a hammer last week? You're not selling enough how this started. I Hogan was trying not to talk about it. is on the phone, and and Bully sneaks in with a, some sort of hammer or something, and Hogan hangs up the phone, and then, like, he knows Bully is behind him. It's Hogan since was tingling. He, he spins around, and he pins Bully against the wall, and oh my god, it looks so sad. Like, I couldn't suspend my disbelief for two seconds that Hulk Hogan really pinned this guy against a wall. Hogan, like, is is so immobile. 
And and he, I don't know what's going on with Hogan. He teased on Twitter that he was getting back into training for another run. And then, like, the next day, he tweeted something to the effect of, body just can't do it no more. So I don't know if he was planning on doing something and, and he found out that he just can't physically, which doesn't explain this show since they still seem to be teasing this confrontation. But it was sad to see Hogan here. Then we got a segment that, despite my best efforts, I may never be able to forget. Brooke Hogan was in the ring for a promo. I'm sure she's a nice girl, Vinny. Don't you remember Hogan Knows Best? Yeah. She was the she was the most normal, likable person on the entire show. Undoubtedly true. Now, as a performer on television in a wrestling show live, she absolutely sucks. Much better as a pop star. First of all, she was an eight-foot woman cutting a promo on a mic that was five feet high. So you couldn't hear her at all. You couldn't hear her very well. She was blowing her lines left and right, like when she said, after the girls' shows, that's all everyone talked about on the shows. Something close to that. She knew she was fucking up. She was laughing at herself awkwardly. She called out all the knockouts to deliver a state of the division. State of the division address. Yeah. So they brought out all the girls, and Mickey came out last. and All the girls and Eric Young. All the girls, by the way, means four. Five women and a guy. Yeah. There's five. Mickey, Gail, Taryn. ODB. ODB. Rook? Hogan, I mean? Velvet. Oh, yeah, Velvet was out there. The hell did you forget that? I don't know. Um, so Mickey came out, and she thanked Rook for inviting her out there, and Brooke told her to shut up, basically. And Rook said it was time to talk about Eric, and the mention of Eric Young's name, all the fans cheered, and Brooke looked annoyed and told them to shut up. Because you can't have fans cheering for wrestlers. It makes them look like stars. Not during the State of the Division address, Vinny. That's the difference. She has more important things to talk about. This is a very important address here. This is the State, Vinny, of the Division. <laughs> so, Brooke pointed out that ODB and Eric Young were the t- knockout tag champs. And it's been, it feels like it's been a year. And uh, Eric finally admitted that, yes, they'd had the belts for a long time. Most of the time, the belts have been in their closet. He acknowledged that it is true. He is not a woman, technically. Called himself the toughest man in this ring. Handed the belts over to Brooke. Announced it was National Kissing Day. Made out with ODB. And then he and his wife left to presumably have sex. He did not give a shit about (laughs) these titles. And as we have said many times... Wrestlers get awesome when they don't give a shit. I have uh, been a... I, I've been hit and miss on Eric Young. I started out as the biggest Eric Young fan in the world based on seeing him do an indie show out here, and he was by far the star, and like the only guy that all the other wrestlers stuck around and watched his match, and he was so entertaining. And then he went to TNA, and he did the absolute stupidest comedy every single solitary... Every single solitary show, the, the the comedy was so bad with Eric Young, and I, I turned violently on the character. And now I have done a, another 180, back to loving Eric Young. He's awesome. He's been awesome the past two weeks on this show. I will take that a step further. I used to hate Eric Young, and I used to hate ODB. But I really like the couple of Eric Young and ODB. Yeah, they've been great. They are great. I don't want them to ever break up. So they left, sadly. Which left just all the other girls in the ring. And we got Brooke blowing her lines and trying to ad lib. And the other girls trying to get her back on course and talking to each other. And they all talked over each other. And all I could think was this segment was like right in the middle of game seven of the NBA Finals. Yep. No one watched this show. And why would they? Sometimes train wreck TV does ratings. Oh, that is true. That is true. So. Brooke but no, then, I was ready to watch the game. <laughs> Brooke then decided that it was time to Gail Kim versus Taryn Terrell in a ladder match. That made me sad, kind of. Uh, that's yes. I suppose it's possible that they're going to have an awesome ladder match, but their Falls Count Anywhere match was so good that it, it saddens me the idea that now they're going to do a match that probably is not going to be very good. It's not going to be very good, and I, I'm worried they thought or they'll get hurt. Yeah, they did this match. 
and no one got hurt, so we can book them in a more dangerous match. So I think they're going to keep raising the stakes until someone does get hurt. Brooke then announced she was done, and they could all leave. This was a god-awful... I'm trying to think. God-awful segment. I was le- legitimately uh, trying to think of a uh, worse television personality than Brooke was here. Like, Mike Adam Lee was at least funny when he fucked up. Brooke, luckily, she was... She had no desire to be there. She would rather have been anywhere on the, else in the world. Uncomfortable the entire time. Unnatural. Unfunny. And she knew it. She was well aware. It looked like she was, she was horrible and knew it. Yeah. What can you do? They replayed Sting walking down the ramp. The whole thing. They replayed Sting, everyone, walking down a ramp. A good... 30 to 45 seconds of walking it was very important that they replay it. Hulk met with Brooke, ordered her to leave because she sucked. No, that's not true. He did order her to leave, but he said she had done a great job. So he said. He's a worker. He said he's sending her away so Bully Ray couldn't get her or something. I don't know. We've talked about the WWE app many times. About how you can do things like watch guys watch TV on it. And ask myself, why would anyone ever want this app? TNA has done them one better. You can get a TNA app that lets you watch a video game version of Jeff Hardy doing bicep curls. <laughs> and apparently, you work out with him. Apparently, this will help you get in shape. Yeah. Come on, Vinny. It's the best they could do. Try it. AJ Styles versus Samoa Joe. This they was were awesome. The last two guys in the Bound for Glory series left, so that no, nobody called anybody out here. AJ outright cut a promo saying that he was in this for the money. That TNA was no, was no place for a hero. Taz at one point claimed that he had been in the main event mafia. I have no idea what he's talking about because he has never wrestled. Well, he's an ace and an ace. He's never wrestled. I guess that's true. Maybe the main event mafia had an announcer. I don't remember. So, yeah, it's uh, impossible for Joe and AJ to have a bad match. Literally impossible. The main event mafia. You're Googling this now? This is, believe it or not, on Wikipedia. Main event mafia. Believe it or not, there have been a number of incarnations. The original incarnation was Kurt Angle, Sting, Kevin Nash, Booker T, and Scott Steiner, later joined by, it says, Samoa Joe. And then we had... Associates of the original incarnation. Tracy Brooks represented the knockouts. Charmel was Booker's valet. Jenna Maraska was Kevin Nash's valet. Taz was Samoa Joe's advisor. Oh, that's right. Sally Boy and Big Rocco were security guards. No, you're not expected to remember any of that. That's right. When Taz first showed up in TNA, he was Joe's mentor or something. That's right. So, yeah, AJ and Samoa Joe. <laughs> There's a picture here of Kurt Angle in a suit. And uh, a Wikipedia editor has put the following caption. Kurt Angle dressed as a godfather according with the gimmick. Got it? Good. So, yeah, um, they've had many matches better than this. But like I say, it's impossible for them to have an outright bad match. It was a time limit draw, 15 minutes. And there were not many points where it seemed like it was going to do anything else but go to a draw. There was one point when AJ got his new calf slicer submission on. And Joe just uh, righted it for a second or two and just reached back and grabbed AJ's head and got out. He needs to work on that hold. Finisher killed. I was more concerned with AJ's complete and utter lack of anything resembling a guard. You're unimpressed with the jiu-jitsu skills? No, it's Joe tackled him with like 30 seconds left, and AJ just laid there, and Joe passed his guard and was giving him a beating. Uh. Didn't even try. Come on now, AJ. Bully Ray was on the phone with Brooke, disappointed she had left. Did you announce it was a 15-minute draw? I did. All right. Two points each. You may all update your scorecards. Bully Ray was on the phone with Brooke. He was disappointed she had left, asked her to come back. 
ordered some of the guys to get on their bikes and escort her back to the building. Hogan talked to Chris Saban, Kenny King, and Suicide. Said they would have a three-way next week, and the winner of that match would be the champ who could turn his belt in at uh, uh, Destination X, which they did announce would be a live show on Impact this year. Main event was Bobby Roode and Jeff Hardy. It was fun. Good match. It was short. Hardy won with a twist of fate, and that was it. Great, by the way. (laughs) It was short, not much to it, but for what it was, totally fine. Very good match. Bully Ray cut the main event promo in the ring. That is, by the way, my entire note here. Hardy beat Rude. Good match. I I wrote Bobby Rude versus Jeff Hardy. Fun, period. Short, period. Hardy won clean with a twist of fate. Bully Ray cut his promo. He said that between the Bound for Glory series and the uh, X Division next week, there were 15 men fighting to take a shot at him. He should have pointed out all the other guys who lost qualifiers to get into the Bound for Glory series. Closer to 25 dudes. That's right. He said he was a lover, not a fighter. He called out Brooke. Sting came out to the main event Mafia music instead. He jibber jabbered a bit. Ray said he could snap his fingers and his gang would come out and kill Sting. It should be noted, by the way, that earlier he had called Brooke and demanded she return to the building. And he sent the guys to go make sure she got to the building. And she never got to the building, nor did the guys ensure that she got to the building. So something is missing here in this storyline. Maybe we'll find out next week. Yeah. Well, he did say some of them. Some of you go get Brooke. Some of you stay here with me. Yeah. So the ones that stayed got beat up. What about the other guys that left? I don't know. You you were right. We don't know what happened to them. So, yeah. Ray kept snapping his fingers to get his gang to come out, and the gang never showed up. Cut to a video backstage where his gang had been beaten up. And then it turned out uh, Kurt Angle was in a suit, because that's what you do when you're in the Mafia. And he came out and he put Ray in the ankle lock and Sting screamed at Bully Ray, and that was the end of the show. So, yes, so far it is just Sting and Kurt Angle. Well, they had another member at the taping, so we'll find out about that next week. Only thing I don't like about this angle, at this point at least, maybe there will be more in the future. But the one thing that I really don't like about this angle is... So, AJ is now a member of the main event mafia. AJ? I'm sorry, uh, Kurt Angle. He's now a member of the main event mafia. And apparently, uh, I believe next week, they uh, they add Samoa Joe. At least according to Wikipedia. I could be wrong. But let's just say that they do, okay? Actually, uh, let me me read the spoilers. Spoilers are up on your site right now. (laughs) Let me find out. I was actually just clicking them to look at it. Samoa Joe joined the main event mafia. All right, so. So, now we've got... Kurt Angle and Samoa Joe in the main event mafia, which, by the way, is sounding an awful lot like the original main event mafia, not a new main event mafia. But anyway, the point is, where the fuck were Kurt Angle and Samoa Joe when Sting was getting his ass handed to him at the pay-per-view? I have no idea. Right? So Sting, in storyline... Maybe he hadn't bought them suits yet. ...got his ass handed to him by Bully Ray and the Aces and Eights, and not a single solitary person came out to make the save. Which which resulted in Sting being so angry and irate at the situation that he immediately went on Twitter and bitched. And then he came to the impact zone and he said he was so upset that nobody in the back had come out to help him that he was going to have to amass a new main event mafia to watch his back. Which so far consists of guys who are in TNA that did not come out to help him. Right? Am I missing something? 100% right. I would understand if if Sting said, I must create a new main event mafia, and like they brought in John Morrison and, I don't know, TJ Perkins or whoever, new guys, right? Because no one in TNA helped him. Right. So he's got to go get some new guys. But instead, everyone he's getting is someone that didn't help him at the fucking pay-per-view. Maybe this will be explained down the road. But he sure, these men sure weren't his friends two weeks ago. So we watched part of Impact before Brian's uh, cable threw up all over itself. Sting came out for a promo. Play the main event mafia music. He got in there, said about 10 words. Now came Kurt Angle again to the main event of mafia music. And I was thinking to myself, sure is annoying having to hear this song twice in 30 seconds. And then Taz outright asked, why did we have to listen to the stupid music twice in a row? Once again, Taz was uh, our voice on the show. Kurt pointed out that the main event mafia had first formed four years ago. Now they were back. 
They were going to take out the Aces and Nates and make sure Bully Ray lost the world title. And they'd be adding in an extra person tonight. And Taz noted this was very unfair of them because the Aces and Nates, quote, were not bothering anybody. That was funny. Chris Saban was walking backstage when the Aces and Nates jumped him. And this was shot uh, so the cameraman could clearly see that the Aces and Nates were hiding in like a truck or something, ready to ambush this man. And they did nothing to warn him and only videotaped it as it happened. What assholes. So they just held Saban as Bully Ray gave him a message. He called him a good little X Division wrestler. Told him good luck in his match tonight, but warned him, you don't challenge me for the world title because you don't want any part of me. They let him go. We were introduced to Adam O'Reiner. <laughs> Adam O'Reiner, everybody. Not O apostrophe Reiner. No. O.H. Reiner. O'Reiner. O'Reiner. Not ready for prime time, this fella. Adam O'Reiner looked like he had just walked out of the power plant. Enormous, jacked up, tattoos, openly talking, openly talking about how he had no wrestling training. Called himself the Big O. Said the ring was his O-zone. Suicide versus Kenny King versus Chris Saban. <laughs> Toggle just died. <laughs> you got a text. <laughs> Toggle just died. Yeah. So now I got you, nothing. You can't upload this then. Why did my toggle die? I don't. I don't even know what a toggle what is. What in the hell is going on? Figure four connected. Garage band. What in goddamn is going on? I don't know. I'm trying to uh, reconnect to the uh, figure four network here. It's not working. No, it's not. It's broken. Let's just stop. <laughs> just keep doing impact. Let's <laughs> just stop right now. I don't no care. No one cares about half an impact review. Yeah, they do. We're, we're talking about uh, Ono. Oh <laughs> what is his name? <laughs> Where the hell is my toggle? <laughs> All right, so we had a three-way here with Suicide and Kenny King and Chris Saban. Um, spoiler alert, Suicide was Austin Aries. That was revealed at the end of the show. There was a uh, no mention over here. It was supposed to be a surprise. Battery. Plans toggles out of batteries. It's plugged in. It's plugged in. <laughs> Everything electronic in Brian's life is breaking. Is He's trying the other outlet. I fully expect us to be plunged into darkness at any time. It just has an exclamation point on the battery. The battery simply has an exclamation point. He's trying all the outlets in this room. There are a lot of outlets in here, I will say. I don't know if you planned that. All right. So this is three-way. Uh, yeah, the gimmick was that Austin Aries was in the suicide costume. And knowing that going in, you could totally tell it was him. I don't know <laughs> if I didn't know going in, if I would be able to pick it out. The other match... It was very long, the longest three-way they've done since they went to the all-three-way format. And uh, King got Suicide up in a fireman's carry, and Suicide rolled through in a sunset flip, and he hooked the ropes for the pin. So Suicide won the X Division title, uh, beating Chris Saban, who was not even pinned to lose the belt. And that meant Suicide would have the right to cash in at uh, Destination X and get a world title shot. But wait! There's a swerve. Hulk Hogan came out with a limping T.J. Perkins. Hogan got his name right, said that TJ was suicide. He had always been suicide throughout the years. Been working hard to put food on the table, he said. Killed the gimmick. He did. He unmasked him here. Just <laughs> Would it not have been possible? Maybe I'm just, like, in a mood. But couldn't you just brought out TJ Perkins with a sack on his head? It had Hogan say, <laughs> the man under the sack is the real suicide. But there's an imposter in the ring. Did they have to unmask and reveal the identity of this man after all these years? Apparently, for this? apparently they did. Couldn't Hogan just say it doesn't count because that's not suicide in the ring? Well, 
He could have, maybe, but he didn't. So, yeah, TJ Perkins is officially suicide and always has been. So all those times you thought it was somebody else, you were wrong. All those times he was six inches taller, you were wrong. He uh, Hulk demanded that Suicide unmask, but Suicide ran through the crowd with his new belt. That was that. After the break, Hogan said he was going to give Suicide to the end of the show to reveal himself. We met the other gut check contestant. They showed him playing guitar and playing drums and playing the saxophone. Turns out that he's a musician who got into wrestling on accident. Just like the other guy was a weightlifter who got into wrestling on accident. <laughs> Two gut check competitors who don't really want to do this. Yep. So, uh, although it did occur to me, Ryan Howe's story on how he got into wrestling is exactly the same as Hulk Hogan's. Except he is Hulk Hogan, and I'm guessing the guys who discovered Ryan Howe are not the Briscoes. The other Briscoes. So then we got the match. Ryan Howe came out as a parody of every 1980s hair metal band ever. Straight out of Steel Panther. He then Steel Panther. They all, they all know what I mean. Just because you're in a bubble doesn't mean they are. How dare you. He then began to do a guitar solo. Can you just say, like, uh, Def Leppard? Yeah. be a lot easier. Steel Panther, Brian, is a modern band that does a parody of 80s hair metal. I see. They're very Can popular. you say Fozzy? I would bet Steel Panther. I'm sure Steel Panther is more popular than Fozzy. Not to this audience. I bet you're wrong. <laughs> These are wrestling fans. Every single one of them knows Fozzy. If one of them doesn't know Steel Panther, then I'm correct. And I didn't, so I'm right. <laughs> Joey, the joy you take in this. Go on. Point is, he was pretending to play guitar, and we were supposed to believe it was real. He was like playing the guitar with his teeth and mimicking all the air moves and stuff. And uh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he was really playing. It looked suspicious. Taz compared him to Van Hammer repeatedly. Then they had a lousy pro wrestling match. Lousy does not begin to uh, <laughs> describe this match. Uh, the the oh no guy. We can call him the oh no guy. That's fine. What's his name? O'Reilly. O O'Reiner. O'Reiner. O O'Reiner. O'Reiner took some god awful bumps. Slow as hell. Uh, this was amateur hour on national television. Yeah. I I don't know. I like the spot where Ryan Howe went for a body press and he hit O'Reiner in the shins. Sometimes I think a gut check works if you got two guys that actually know what they're doing. Yes. But when it's amateur hour, it's so bad. It's like lucha. Like when you got two guys that are really good at lucha, it's phenomenal. And when you got two guys that suck at lucha, it's like the absolute worst in the world. That's what this was here. This was just two guys having a terrible amateur hour match on national television. So Reiner won with a power slam. And then both guys will meet the judges next week to see if they get contracts. Hint. No. <laughs> Watch O'Reiner get it. He will. He's big and jacked up. Or get a uh, WWE developmental deal, one of the two. Sting and Angle walked down a hallway and said things would go better this time, and then they walked into a door. That was an entire bit. You walked into a door? Well, through a door. Not through like, it? They opened the door and they stepped through. I see. So he walked into a room. Yeah, I guess you're right. You're my editor. I thought this is live. <sighs> Cover that already. Bully Ray met with TJ Perkins backstage. He wanted to know if TJ was working with Kurt and Sting. Made sure to point out how little he was repeatedly. And TJ knew nothing and Ray was getting frustrated. Mickey James wrestled Velvet Sky. This is one of my favorite impact moments ever. Not because of the match, but because Taz took it upon himself to sing Mickey James' theme song. I don't know if Taz was drunk this evening or what, but he was in quite a mood and it was in rare form and I really enjoyed him. Taz? Yeah. It's possible this is the end for Taz. Oh, really? Yeah. I don't know for sure. You any but, scoops, uh, scoops, brother? Uh, rumors he's going to WWE. Oh. Oh, there you go. Yeah. To do what? I don't have any of this confirmed. They're just rumors. 
I really don't know anything. Go back to announcing. All right. I don't know if he'd go back to announcing. I mean, they did get rid of Striker, so he could go to replace Striker. TNA hired Big John. Changes are coming in TNA, everybody. And uh, and there may be some changes the other way, too. Who knows? We'll soon find out. So Mickey cut a promo saying the championship changed people. Not her, of course, but it had changed Velvet. Mickey's character is fantastic. She says she said that uh, when Velvet was champion, they were friends. But now Mickey was champion and Velvet didn't like her anymore. It was all Velvet's fault. She said she was still worried about Velvet's health and gave her a chance to back out of the match. And Velvet said no until they wrestled. It was all Mickey working over Velvet's leg and then Velvet making a comeback in which she completely ignored the fact that her leg was supposed to be hurt. They were brawling on the floor and did a head scissors spot out there. And I don't blame Mickey for this, but... <laughs> you know, when you take a head scissors, you basically do a somersault. And uh, Mickey took this head scissors and literally just did a somersault. Luckily, a six-year-old playing on the playing on the yard. And they got back in the ring, fucked something up. Mickey kicked her in the knee, and then she put her in her new hold, where she grapevines both legs and puts in a chin lock. That hold is actually, in all seriousness, that is a badass submission move. And she put her in this, and Velvet tapped out, and that was the end of the match. So Mickey won. Chrissy's tits then appeared to interview Velvet. <laughs> I can't even say she was showing cleavage. There was a lot of flesh here. So uh, the interview developed, and the crowd was so uh, uh, moved by Velvet's performance, they t- chanted, you tapped out at her. She did some horrible fake crying. She said she was heartbroken. She went up the ramp. That sucked. It was very poor. It was very poor. Sting and Angle were just hanging out backstage. She's so- a pretty girl. She is. That's absolutely true. Bobby Roode like walked through them in his robe, and he stopped and smirked, and they kept walking. Sting, Sting and Angle looked like each other, and the whole gimmick is they only take former world champions in their club, and he's a former world champion. Mm. And that's the point where the show ended. That's the end of the show, everybody. That's all we got. 